Hi, I'm Eric Rackland, and my talk today is about my role as an archivist, or what's on the HHC USB drives. So far, for the last couple decades, I've been collecting everything new that was created, putting them on my website to share with everyone. But with no new calculators in a while, a shrinking user community, it means there's a lot less new stuff. Instead, I've been focusing less time on the present, what's new, and instead more on the past. I've been bringing back dead websites that the, own, the owners of them have no longer maintained, and I've been trying to aggregate all the information I can find to put it all in one place. I feel that I'm now more of an archivist or an historian. I'm documenting and organizing everything I can find, and also learning more about I guess you'd call them the golden years of calculators. We heard 1981 had 180 people at the conference. Back when there were so many more people involved, before we had mobile phones, before we had desktop PCs distracting, distracting us. Then once I make everything, my final thing is to share everything I accumulate. I either put it on websites or I share it via torrents. I don't know how many of you know this, but I've got about maybe five, ten torrents on my website for downloading large quantities of information. And finally, on USB drives, where even a torrent can be a massive undertaking. So first, the HHC 2019 USB drive, which every one of you received with your packets. I gave a talk on it last year, and it is very similar to last year's drive, except it's now twice the size, 64 gigabytes instead of 32. It has all the same categories, so emulators and ROMs, manuals, photographs, fonts, publications, discussion forum archives, all the conference proceedings going back about 20 years, Jake Schwartz's PPC DVD, Warren Furlow's hp41.org archive, and my website, and quite a lot more. Here's just an overview of what kind of data is on this desk. You can see it's uh, over three quarters of a million files. That's over 60 billion bytes, 56 gigabytes. And not much free space, just a little bit, little bit over a gigabyte free. All compressed? It's not compressed. <laughs> Some sections are unchanged since last year. There's a, a fonts folder that has a lot of different fonts, both keycap fonts and the screen dot matrix fonts many of them made by HP or Ted Kerber or Luis Vera. There's the HP Solve <coughs> newsletter, which Richard Nelson published with HP for a number of years. There are all the HP learning modules. HP published those as well, but written partially by outside people. I know Gene Wright put a lot of work into some of them. I think a few other people did as well. There are all the old calculator ads that Gene presented last year. That's 1,500 images from newspapers that had been scanned. There are hundreds of photographs of calculators and accessories. Some are HP official press photographs. Some were marketing materials on slides that I got from Richard and scanned those in. Some are photographs I took. Some are photographs others took. The PPC notes which is a newsletter published by a TI calculator enthusiast group, included at Gene's request. And PPX, PPX Exchange, which was a newsletter published by TI. The ROM dumps of many HP calculators, including a lot of uh, pre-release beta ROMs. And then a historic copy of my website as it looked back in December 1997. So these are all of the things that are identical to what's on the, 2008, on the 2018 drive. Now for what has changes. Uh, sections that have had minor changes include the emulators. Uh, AMU48 is now updated to the latest version, and I updated my faceplates, my skins that I made for it as well. And Tony Nixon has his TNX emulators of classic calculators. A number of those are updated. Claudio's new RPL I added. That wasn't included before, but now it's reaching a more mature state, so I felt it was worth including. Somehow I'd missed WP31 and 34, so those are on there as well. And then the other emulators, EMU28, 42, and non-parel, and HP-produced ones are unchanged. Another minor change was to my website. I updated the latest version as of about a week and a half ago. 
But by having the larger drive, now I can go back to what I did on the 2017 USB drive, which is also including the uncompressed version of all the archives. So whenever you encounter a zip file or a gzip file, you can view on the contents page directly in your browser what those text files are and stuff like that without having to open the archive, since the zip file contents are all also stored uncompressed on the drive. That added a couple of gigabytes. Finally, something that's a, it's available on my website only if you create an account and log in, but normally you wouldn't see it, and that's the historic versions of all the files on my site. So over the last couple decades, maybe someone releases a program, then updates it, updates again, updates it again. Maybe there are 20 different versions, so I've got all of those. So you can see the history of how, how all the programs changed over time. They're all included on there. And then the conference proceedings, this year's proceedings are included as well. And also thanks to Richard, I was able to get fill in some of the earlier conferences. So I was missing a number of the talks and, and associated information, like per, uh, program code and stuff like that, from some of the earlier conferences. So it's pretty com complete through about, back to about 2006 or so. More sections with minor changes are Warren's hp41.org site. Uh, it's based on the torrent of the DVD, which you can download from his site, but that's only current through 2016. So I've gone through and manually found all the changes since then and merged them into the torrent. So that's now current as of this past month. The newsgroups and discussion forums, I've updated count.sys at hp48 messages through August of this year. I talked more about that either last year or the year before, but that has about 230,000 messages that were posted on that newsgroup over the years. The other, the other forums are not changed since last year, so it's all the CompSys handhelds, North Dakota University System email list, and then both the old museum form and the new museum form through, I think, spring of 2018. The fi finally, Jake's going to tell you more about this, but the PPC DVD is updated to version 2.35, which adds a year of data file and enhances the EduCalc library and a few other things. But I think his talk will be next to tell you about that. Some sections with bigger changes. Under the manuals collection, the HP official manuals, those are not changed. Those are all the ones you can download straight from their website. Uh, Katie Wasserman, she's collected hundreds of manuals for non-HP calculators, and I did update that with her latest changes. This, there are about a dozen new manuals. Then other community scan manuals, these are for HP calculators and computers. Uh, it's mostly unchanged again, but there are a few additions since last year. That's just hundreds and hundreds of manuals for all the HP calculators. Then there's a books folder, uh, there's one new addition to that. Gene Wright has agreed to put his book, Quantitative Analysis for Business, on the USB drive. Normally he charges for that, but all oh, you get a free copy of that ebook. And then finally, uh, basic manuals. There's a website, uh, basic.hop2.org, and it has hundreds of manuals for various calculators and palm tops that run basic, uh, from Casio, Cyan, Sharp, TI, and other brands. And I've included all those on there now, too. Then the section that has the archives of other websites, that's also seen some big improvements. A couple are unchanged. The hp42s.com that I mentioned last year, which was just dedicated to the 42s, that's just like before. JacquesLaporte.org, that was one I talked a lot about last year where, with the help of several others, was able to fully restore his website, which talks all about the inner workings of the HP 35, the hardware, software, algorithms, all that. Very fascinating website. After he passed away, uh, a family member of his tried to bring it back online, but it was still missing a lot. So with the help of archive.org and others, it was able to fill that out. And that was on the drive last year, unchanged this year. Richard? Do you know, if you've gone through that material, if the I'm, st I'm still kind of looking for a, a, a meaningful explanation of the 35 uh, bug, 2.02 bug. He does have some mention of that, some discussion oh, of that. I'll look at that. Then something new this year is Joe Horns, hhuc.us. He's still running that site, but just again, so you have a copy of everything. 
that entire website with all of the conference websites from 2000 through the present is mirrored on there as well, updated as of a few days ago. Then two new additions, which I'll talk more about later, but just a quick overview. First of all, many of you have probably heard of Valentin Albillo, and he's a programmer from Spain that he's, he's been working in the community for decades. This brilliant programmer, done a lot of really amazing development for like the 71, 41, uh, all sorts of other models. And not just HP, but Sharp as well. And he, there's a website for him on there. And finally, the next one, which I'll talk more about later as well, is greendike.nl. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Jay Greendike. He's a Dutch guy. And he recreated manuals for a number of HP calculators over the course of probably a decade or so. Unfortunately, last year, his site went down. He no longer had hosting. And it was gone. So I was able to restore that and put that on here, too. Some completely new things. There's a French publication, La Gazette, uh, De Pocket Care, or however you say it. There are 11 issues of that produced from 2013 to 2018. That's on there. Lots of really good stuff, H HP stuff in there as well, including the Prime, I believe. Uh, HP Journal, this was a big addition. Uh, HP Research published this journal of 478 issues for 50 years. And that's about 10 gigabytes of the drive. So all, all of them, you can download them from HP, but now you have them all in one place. And finally, to fill out the drive, since there was still five, you know, probably about seven gigabytes of space left on it, I put some videos on there. Uh, Gene Wright produced some training videos for financial calculations on the 12C and the TIBA2+. Uh, if you were at HHC 2000, 2006, you might remember the HP Origins video that was shown. That's included on there now. At HHC 2007, we were shown an interview that Steve Lapson did with Dave Cochran. Talking, he was, Dave Cochran was a, one of the engineers behind the early calculators and computers, late 60s, early 70s, that kind of thing. He was at the conference last year, gave an excellent talk, I've got that up on, on, on the drive as well. He won Best Speaker. Yes, yes, he did win Best Speaker. But anyway, that interview was shown then, and uh, Steve gave me permission to include that in the drive. In fact, uh, he had had it on YouTube, but it was a lower resolution copy. I talked to him, and he published a, a higher quality version. So this is better than you would have seen before. Uh, another video I put on there, it's called Learning About the HP 48. HP made that back in 91. And that was recently posted in the forum on YouTube, and I included that. Finally, I have all of my talks from last year's conference. All, all of the talks I recorded at last year's conference, excuse me. And I'll talk more about that later, too. So now to the things that I skipped. First, Valentin Albillo's HP collection. As I mentioned, he's been active in the community many years. He'd had a website long time, a long time ago. I believe his daughter had maintained it. And unfortunately, it, did, it no longer is online. And he no longer was able to maintain it either. So his materials have been kind of lost unless you could find them on various HP Museum posts over the years. Uh, he, there, were, there was a discussion in the museum forum earlier this year about trying to get that back online, and I responded to him saying, hey, I'll help you out, I can host it for you, whatever you need. He got back to me a little bit, a, little, a few months later. He said that he didn't have any interest in learning HTML or the technical parts of running a website, but he was interested in my offer to host the material for him. And because he'd made hundreds of programs for 71, 42, 41, the, the Voyager series, and the Sharp didn't want this to be gone. So I was very excited that, excited that he responded to me. So what I created for him was a very simple, it's not fancy or anything. The web layout is extremely simple. Uh, just a dynamically generated website. He's able to use a form to upload files, put descriptions in, stuff like that and then it publishes them for him. If there's pictures or videos, it shows a screenshot or a, a frame excerpt from it. It shows metadata for the videos, how long it is, the resolution of the pictures. And then it's organized into separate pages. A lot of times when you have content management systems, they make really hard to read URLs, so I made sure all the addresses are easy to remember and read. Uh, once I put this thing together for him, 
he was able to add around 300 files to it with minimal help from me. Really, the only times he needed help is when he was discovering bugs in my code, which I then had to fix, and then he was able to proceed. It's still under construction. I know he's got a lot more he wants to add to it. It's nowhere near complete, but the current snapshot of it is on the drive, and he just announced it in the museum forum the other day. Here's a screenshot of the front page of it. Again, if, maybe if someone wants to volunteer to write a, a style sheet to make it look prettier, they can. But for now, it's just default format. You can see there are sections for the calculator, HP calculators with articles, programs, challenges, pictures, selected threads from the forum, as well as a section for sharp pocket computers, other brands, and then some mis miscellaneous pictures, which are mostly fractals. A sample of what the HP calculator programs page looks like is a, just some text at the top and then you can see the programs below. You can click to download the PDF. It's got the MD5 checksum, the pages, the PDF, all that dynamically calculated. So he doesn't have to enter any of that. All he has to do is upload the file, give it a title, and type a description. Here's from the fractals page. You can see some of the, the pictures of the fractals that he generated. And this is an example of one of the administration pages that he can use for adding or modifying. In this case, is for modifying an existing, existing program. So here you can change the title. The, it, you can see some HTML tags in there, but it will automatically add some of them. He, 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 however, did end up going through, as you saw, and added some formatting, italics, bold, font colors, stuff like that. So he's doing some of the HTML, too. But all of the infrastructure of it, he doesn't have to worry about at all. Any questions on, on Valentine's site? The next big thing that I did was the greendike.nl manual site restoration. So as I was saying a few minutes ago, there is a Dutch guy by the name of Greendike, or however you say his name, and he had recreated manuals for the 11C, the 41C, a lot of application cards and modules for the 41C, as well as the 65, 67, 80, 85, and 97. And every single one of these documents he pretty much recreated from scratch. It looked like he, he scanned the documents, did some OCR, manually typed in a lot of stuff with the pictures. Some of them he used scanned images, but many of the images, diagrams, he redrew. So it was a tremendous, he must have spent thousands and thousands of hours recreating all these manuals. And they're page accurate. So each page you see in your browser corresponds to a page from the original manual. Is there a question? These are all in English, though? Yes, these are only English language. He, he also had a 65 emulator. It was written by someone else, Greg Sidney Smith. But this, the Green Dyke then went in and improved it so he could load application cards. And he included 50 application cards you could load into this online 65 emulator running in your web browser. Unfortunately, this all disappeared. In late 2018, he decided to shut down the site. His web hosting was expiring. He, he wasn't going to continue maintaining it. And unfortunately, there was no good archive of it either. Uh, he, first of all, for understandable reasons to minimize load on his server, he was preventing people from automatically downloading the site. In fact, he would ban your IP address, as some people lamented, if you tried to do so. And also, because his site was dynamically generated in PHP, once you've downloaded it, it's not really going to work like the original thing anyway. Even archive.org, which is a great way to find some of these websites that have disappeared, didn't even have much of it archived. Uh, the number of people had asked him, uh, trying to, to offer him to host it, and he was not interested. The impression that people got is that he, because he did not own the copyright for these manuals, HP owns the copyright, he didn't want to have any liability. But I think there's a very strong argument that it's fair use. HP isn't selling the manuals, they're selling the calculators. And this is just allowing these manuals to still exist. Uh, I had asked him as well if I could host it, and he, I did not receive a response to that message. In the few, uh, month or so before the site went down, he put a countdown saying, this number of days before it shuts down. And the number of people in the forum who tried to save it all, 
And I didn't want to get banned, so I went through and manually opened every single page with my web browser and saved it, thousands of pages, and spent probably 20, 25 hours doing that. Uh, and then he was using frames in some pages of the site, which would mean there are thousands multiplied by three or four to get all the frames, but that would take too long. I did not save the frames, I just saved examples of it so I could recreate it later. And I was able to save everything with hours to spare. Unfortunately, the site did shut down before the date he said. So I think a number of people were taken by surprise there. But thankfully, just a few hours left, I got everything saved. <laughs> However, that's useless. <laughs> because when I had, the, had them saved, it was 20,000 files, 300 megabytes, lots of duplication, and nothing was actually browsable. So I just had a, a folder with a whole lot of data, and I knew it would take me a long time, so I just set it aside. Well, half a year later, so in July, I finally had some time to go through it. So I wrote some scripts to, to do find and replace using regular expressions to fix links. I wrote scripts to regenerate pa the pages that I didn't save, and ultimately created something that worked. It took me a lot less time than I thought it would, really only tens of hours, I'm not sure exactly, probably no more than 50 or so, definitely under 100, uh, mainly because I automated a lot of the work. The final product is 12,500 12 files, about 100 megabytes, 2,300 individual pages of manuals. And think about, when he did that, that's 2,300 pages times however long it took him to make each page, so I'm sure when you consider recreating all these graphics, that was thousands of hours. I tried to make it an exact reproduction of the original, but there were some exceptions. First of all, going through it, I noticed there were thousands of typos. Uh, I'd say most of them were actual typographical errors. The remainder looked like OCR errors. It, every page had at least one on average. Some pages had 10 or more. So I fixed all the ones I saw. Uh, also, with the original design, sometimes you could not link to an individual page in the manual. It was, with the way it was set up with frames, you could just go to the main page, and that's the only address you'd see in your browser. So I changed that so you can now link to any page in any manual. Also, the site's no longer dynamically generated, which means you can now view it on your USB drive and it'll have full functionality. But it's online as well on my archive.hpcalc.org site. In fact, you can download a zip file with the whole thing. You have the USB drive so you don't need it, but wow. anyone else can download that zip file to ensure that these are never lost. Some screenshots of what it looks like. This was the main page of the site, still is now with a restored one. You can see all the different manuals there. In addition, there are a few non-HP calculator things. There's a page on the Thunderbirds, website, uh, Thunderbirds television show, a couple pages on Telecaster guitars, and a slide reel page. But everything else is manuals. But I restored everything. There were a couple images missing from some of the Fender manuals, but I was able to get some of them by looking around online, and then a couple, just a couple images were lost. But everything from the HP stuff, I believe, is restored fully. Here's an example. This is the cover of the 41C manual. So again, it looks just like the actual book. You go through, and you can see it's got all the diagrams. Everything's color-coded. It is a very beautiful, faithful reproduction of the original manuals. I could not stand to have this disappear off the internet, because it's just such a great Great creation. Any questions on the Green Dike before I move on? Uh, yes? I've, I've noticed that there were, you kept the 13 days until the site's going Yes, down. yes. <laughs> uh, how were how our, our uh, flash drives, how were those copied? I, I created one master disk, which took a long time to copy, three quarters of a million files, probably five, four or five hours. But then once I had the one drive created, I just made an image of it on my computer and just wrote the image. And you could write each image in under an hour. I think 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that per drive. Yeah. Is this a, a, a perfect superset of last year's? Yes. There is nothing. So I could just overwrite? Yeah, there should be nothing on last year's drive unless you, for whatever reason, you wanted to see the old version of PPC DVD and the old <coughs> version of my website. Okay, so I can just. Because so I, you could I, I just keep track of that. I have a special uh, whatever, and I keep track. I call them my fixed documents, stuff mm -hmm. that I don't change, that become, you know. So I have the, like, 
Yeah, you have no need to use last year's USB drive now that you have this one. Yeah, my only comment is that um, I believe so, because I don't remember for sure, but uh, that's the reason we use the procedure we do, that if somebody comes up and say, well, I have this new stuff that, that, that we copy it onto the, the, the computer, and then that gets copied onto the master so that nothing is ever lost. That's, that's the whole point. Oh, and here's the 65 emulator. You can see the cards are there. You can't drag and drop them. That'd be really cool. But you have to click on it, copy and paste the code, and then it, it loads it in. And it sh actually shows the card on the top of the calculator. It's, it's pretty impressive. Ne next thing is a video browsing interface I put together. So as I mentioned, I have the videos from last year's conference in the drive. They're also on YouTube. But I wanted to create a little bit better experience when viewing these movies, so I made a, a web-based UI. It's really just one page, one HTML file, with HTML5, with CSS and JavaScript. I'm using a library called plyr.io, and it just wraps around your browser's built-in video player controls so that no matter what browser you're using, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, it has the same interface, same functionality, with some limitations. For example, Chrome supports picture-in-picture, -picture. Edge does not, and, and full screens on most of them, but I think not all of them, but other than that, everything works. It works offline, but one minor exception, I was hoping to get this result before the conference, I did not, and that is the first time you, when you open the page, it needs to connect to the internet, because this plyr.io library is pulling a file from a content delivery network for, Im for the images. You can host your own image, in fact, I tried doing that, putting that in the drive, but then Chrome gives a security error because the way it's loading the file, it apparently doesn't like it. And because it's afraid I'm trying to blow up your computer, it won't load that image. I don't know. <laughs> but what I did beyond what you might see in a normal, a normal POWire.io, which is just a video, video playing interface, is I've added a playlist. It shows all the videos from the conference. Each time it finishes playing a video, it automatically starts playing the next one, kind of like YouTube. The, pl the playlist display tracks, tracks the current video that it's playing. You can resize the video window, make it as small or as big as you want, or have full screen or picture in picture if your browser supports it. I added key combinations. N to go to the next video, P to go to the previous video. You can press F, that's already built in for full screen space to play and pause. Have a little description below the video saying which talk you're, wa you're watching. And if, before I move on, I'm going to do a live demo of some of this stuff. Actually, I have it right here. So this is the very simple HTML file on the root of the USB drive. And there's just links to everything. The most things work, like you click on one of these and it loads, this is the page with all the basic manuals. It's in Spanish, but it's close enough. You can figure it out. <laughs> and Katie Wasserman's site as well is on there. This is, again, ready for offline use. You can hit any one of these, and it'll show it in your web browser. Oh, it's not downloading off the internet. It's, oh, actually, that one is downloading off the internet. <laughs> but maybe you need to fix that. Is all on the drive? They're all on the drive. I may need to fix that one, one of these links. These are the existing ones. HP manuals are all in there. This is the thing I showed last year. Is oh. the 95C on there? I'm not sure. This is the Compact Sys HP 48. All the messages you can see, they're kind of diminishing. There's not yet been a month with no posts, but there have been several with one post. You can see the 15,000, 17,000, 23,000 way back 20 years ago, but kind of disappearing now. We've got jeans, ads, these are the ones I showed you last year. They're all in here. This is what I was talking about the Shock Laporte website where you can go in. And see, in fact, I think somewhere in here we might talk about the bug, but yeah, 
here's showing you the hardware, in-depth look at the hardware, the 35. Wow. And he talks about algorithms. Very, very interesting. And again, he spent a lot of time analyzing them. He was working on, I think, the 65 as well, but passed away before he could finish that one. But there's still, still lots of good stuff on there. And then here's Valentin's site. He's got all his pictures. These are the press photographs of many different calculators as well. Got the 15C limited edition. 95C in there? I don't know. I don't remember. Let's see here. We have a 90. No. Then Jake's PPC DVD. I don't know why, but the links on his DVD do not work inside a web browser. You have to use a separate reader to open them. The ones in, I tried Chrome, I tried Firefox, I tried Edge. You, it, you click, it doesn't do anything. But if you open it in an actual PDF viewer, everything just works perfectly. Then, what I was getting to here, the conference video. In fact, no, I'll show you Green Dike. Green, the Green Dyke site, too. That was, I skipped over that. So here, let's bring up the 15C handbook. Click on that. There's the front cover, the kind of section, and you can just go from page to page. Yeah, everything got scanned, photographs, all the tables are redrawn. Just amazingly high quality work here. And the uh, 65 emulator, demonstrate that too. You turn it on and then you can you just use it right in here. You go in here to the, these are the cards, you can see the code in the card. Or you can, each one of them has documentation as well. How do you get it to the calculator? <sighs> It says, this is somewhere in here explains how to do it. It's a multi-step process. You follow these steps to get it into the calculator. <laughs> then the non-HP stuff is kind of interesting where the Fender Telecaster manual and stuff like that. And some stuff on the, the Fender Bridge television show. That's all in Dutch, I believe. Keep going. Good stuff. <laughs> oh, got a question. Yeah. Does anybody here know what FAB means? They made it up. Thank you. You solved the 62 year problem for me. Jerry Anderson said we made it up. What does FAB mean? He doesn't have a 35 manual, Yeah, there's 35 and 35 best. It's all on here. Oh, he didn't. Yeah. But it's all on right, right. It's all on the right. So if you're looking for a manual, you have to go to two or three different places to, to see if it's there. Well, they're all in the in the under the manual section. But if you want to read a web-based one, then it's just under the Green Dike section. So yeah, here's my website as of a week and a half ago. Where's my miracles? Oh, that's in, that on that's on my website. Yes, yes, oh, that's all in there. You can actually the, the, the PDF is <laughs> yes, PDF is there. Excellent, excellent. But now for what the last thing I want to talk about is the video. So this is the video interface I made. You can you can watch. You can use this video right here. Resize it or whatever. Play your pause. Go to the next video. These, so that's last year's conference. We can scroll down here and here are Gene's, Gene's training videos here. Hello. My name is Gene Ryan. What's the first year you have on there? Gene's son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the old video from 91. This was the really good HP Origins. <laughs> Definitely worth watching. It's about half an hour long. But talking about the history of HP. I can probably, here, can I plug the, 
Do we have the speaker? Can I plug that into the computer? Oh, it's plugged into there. Yeah. Let me turn up the volume maybe on some of this. Uh, this is the speaker here. Oh, this is the number. Oh, wait. Oh, I think it's just coming out of the projector. It's okay. Yes. Okay. Then here's Steve's interview with Dave. And yeah, if I could make a comment. Yes. Uh, apparently at the time that that video was released, um, Steve uh, sent me a copy exclusively for the conference use. And, and I, uh, I had to reprocess it to uh, make it usable. And that's why my copies are not. Uh, and, 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 and also, his, his copy that he put on YouTube was a lower resolution. Yeah. Because he uploaded it to 240p, and now he did, I think it was 360p. It was originally in VHS, so it wasn't much better. But yeah. this is much clearer than what was originally posted. That's, that's a wonderful story. If you're interested. Yeah, very interesting to watch. Yes. And of course, we had him in person. Yeah, last year. So that concludes what's on the USB drive. But that's not all that's here. Something else I've been working on that's not on the conference USB drive is Jake Schwartz's conference recording. So uh, he's been recording these conferences since 1986. Uh, this is this right now, what he's doing sitting right there, this is the 60th conference or mini conference recorded. Uh, his equipment's improved over the years. As you can see, he's got two H two HD cameras right now, but in the early days, I guess it was VHS, and then 8mm, and multiple cameras, and I-8, yeah. <laughs> and every time after the conference, he edits the videos, would make them available on VHS tapes. Uh, watching some of these old videos, I was seeing that sometimes, uh, a couple weeks later, someone would say, oh yeah, I just watched the video from this other mini-conference, so they're getting mailed all over the country, all over the world, PAL format, NTSC, just to keep everything compatible. And then he switched DVD and now Blu-ray for some of them. But there's one problem with this, and that's he's done so much good work that how, are you can, how can you find anything out of all of these? It was 183 plus DVDs, actually probably around 200 now. And if you wanted to find a particular talk, they're not that, uh, that indexed. Some of them don't have any schedule on them. So you'd have to look through the spindle of discs, put it in your DVD player, Fast forward, find the right point. And it's good if you just want to watch through the whole thing, but not if you want to find a single, not if you want to play a single talk. So what I thought I would do is edit them and make them more accessible. So I shipped Jake a four terabyte hard drive. He copied over the contents of all the DVDs. That's just Bob files, video TS, if you know anything about how the DVD, DVD format's stored. And then I spent all my time over a few weeks. I was staying up until two, three in the morning number of these days, uh, going through all these recordings. And what I did is, anytime there's a new talk, I'd identify the start point of it, the end point of it, so I could figure out the, 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 these times are the talks, these times are the gaps between talks, this is who is speaking, what they're talking about, that kind of thing. And if the talks spanned multiple DVDs, I'd have to join them. And all the, all the editing I was doing was lossless, so that no quality would be lost. But what I came up with was, a bunch of MKV files. And actually, MKV is slightly more efficient than DVD. I think it saves about 10% off the storage space without it, without recompressing. And I recorded everything in a spreadsheet. This spreadsheet's on your USB tray, by the way. Uh, after editing all these, I went through 25 of his full conferences and 28 mini conferences. That's all of his, all of his videos from 1986 through 2010, plus I did 2013 and 2014. They're all in the 480i standard definition, that's DVD quality. Then 2011, 2012, Jake hasn't edited yet. I don't want to pester you, but it might be really nice to have 2011, 2012. <laughs> uh, 2015 through 17, I skipped because he had HD versions of it, which he didn't get to me. Then later found out 2013, 2014, he also has an HD, and he's got, he, he, sent, he, he gave me all that now. In fact, I just copied all that this morning, so have all those plus 2018. Those are not ready yet, but I do have HD of 2013 to 2018 that I will be going through at some point. But as I said, resulted in 600 gigabytes of MPEG-2 video. 600. I then added in my conference recordings. I've been recording since 2010. So 
the 2010 through 2017 are all in 720p, and the 2018s in 1080p. Then what I did is I took all of those MPEG-2 files and I re-encoded them as MPEG-4 H.264 format and came up with, I got really lucky, 251 gigabytes. I'm glad I picked the compression ratio I did because I wanted to put them on a 256 gig drive. Wow. That so, still may not fit. It was a... Well, it, 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 it's got about five gigs for you or so. So I could maybe fit another conference until I have to re-encode everything. And it, that encoding took I think it was at least half a week, maybe close to a week. I, I wrote a script that ran it through Handbrake to just encode them all behind the scenes. I then also wrote a, some PHP code that took my spreadsheet as input and outputted an HTML file like what I just showed you for viewing all the videos. In addition to what I just showed you before, I added the ability to have it skip the gaps between the talks. You can just have it automatically watch all the talks. And also some of these conferences Jake recorded and I recorded. So you can press a button to toggle between the two camera angles. It tries to jump to the right point in the video too, but because our recordings are not always the same length, it's not going to be quite accurate. But let me demonstrate that. So this is the conference video's USB drive. And as an example here we have, let's make this full screen. I don't know if you can hear this very well, but Here's, J here's Joe. This is shorthand for the. And hit this button. For the oh, it skips to the other angle. Oh. That means multiply by three, add one, divide by two. Wherever there's a zero, it means just. Wherever there's a zero, it means just divide by two. So you can go to the next talk. That's in between talks. Here's the actual. Oh, right in this room. Yeah, this was here oh, yeah. five years ago. Uh-oh, don't show that one. Somebody dropped the stuff on the car. Oh. Oh. There's the mirror. Everybody's And there's me. Another success, Jeff. And another familiar face. <laughs> And oh, this is—we want to watch this. Yeah, lots of, we can scroll down here and all these videos, thousand videos. Videos of Joe not smiling. I think he smiles a lot, so I'm not sure if there are many of those. Are they indexed so we can just only watch Joe Horn videos? I could look into adding some kind of sorting so you can just watch Joe you know. all the time. <laughs> So you're like, here's 2003, we go back a little farther, here's 98, there's Jake talking about his PPC CD. Oh, more familiar faces we have, here's Jim, 21 years ago, Ted, let's get back, we'll go back in time some more. Here's HHC 95. Eric, Eric Vogel on a conference call. Oh, yeah, that was in Ron's office. Yeah. Here is one of the oh, demonstration of Sparcom cars by Joe. Yeah, that's in Vegas. Yeah, 1994 WCES. Keep going back. Here's HPCC 92. Here we've got Jeremy Smith, almost 30 years ago. That's in, that's in Corvallis. Keep going back. We've got, here's Bob talking about the Sharp Wizard. And it was all the way back in 1986. Now we're down here. We've got. Richard talking about two swap disks. So, yeah. That was the conference, that was the meeting when uh, Janet Cryer introduced the 18C. Yep, here's Janet Cryer right up here. 
He's no longer with us. Come on. So that's the second USB drive available. As I said, 256 gig drive, it has 508 hours of videos from conferences, 1,700 files almost, over 1,000 individual presentations. So if you've got a spare, I don't know, month, <laughs> minimal sleeping, you'll be able to watch all these. <laughs> Yes. How much? You can say that. <laughs> so I brought I I brought a small number with me. I'm right now asking fifty dollars each because these Samsung drives I've bought are forty two dollars plus tax each. So basically selling that cost. And once those are gone, I'll be making more. But I only brought about a dozen with me. Any questions? More questions? Yes. Eric, I've got a question about the philosophy of archiving these things. Yes. You've done a tremendous amount of work here, particularly uh, with the videos. Um, does it make sense thinking for future times to upload all those videos into a YouTube channel? That's something I've looked into, been talking with Jake about that since he recorded the videos, and really it's up to him whether those can go on YouTube. All the ones I recorded are on YouTube already. I've been looking into trying to make this interface work with YouTube, and it seems to mostly be functional with YouTube. There are some limitations. So I could put a page in my website that has that. You can watch the videos. The only the problem I've run into so far is after it finishes playing a video, it doesn't start playing the next video. So you have to click play again. But other than that, it seems to work fine on YouTube. Of course, it'd be a lot better experience watching locally because you have no buffering, it just instantly plays. So you get the 256 gig or maybe eventually 512 gig USB drive, and then you can just watch it off your computer. All right. Cheaper every year. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing, the price just keeps going down. As you've seen, the USB drive for the conference used to be like a 4 gig drive, and now you buy a 64 gig drive for less than the 4 gig drive used to cost. And before that, we had the DVD conference DVDs, conference CDs, that kind of thing. I have sitting, sitting on my desk there a 4 terabyte hard drive, and it's like the size of a deck of cards, and you can buy those for 90 bucks. Well, that first hard drive was five megabytes yeah, yeah. in the lab. But we had two of them. And was half, were they half filled with all your data? Yeah. <laughs> 10 megs. It only took me four years to finish that one. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.